Well, hello everybody. This is Alex Azemi, head of the marketing and communication department at the ICN2. And we are very, very glad to welcome you to the first ICN2 stay at home webinar. I will be in the background pulling the strings. So I'm passing the virtual floor to the ICN2 director, Professor Pablo de Hon, so that he can uh, formally introduce the Manuel Cardona seminar. Thank you very much for, for being here. Okay, so thank you, Alex, and hi, everybody. I see that we are already almost 200 people, so that's uh, really uh, initially exercise. Let's see how the session uh, develops. But I think this is going to be uh, a very clear avenue for uh, meeting and for dissemination of ideas and, uh, and science in the next few months. So uh, let's get used to it. So I'm, I'm very thankful for Alex for setting up this, this new talk. We are uh, starting to use this new software. So I think, uh, I hope everything was, goes smoothly. So I just wanted to say a few words about uh, the Manuel Cardona series that uh, you may uh, or may not know. Uh, this is a series of seminars in which we try to invite very prominent scientists in the field of nanoscience and nanotechnology to ICN2. Uh, we have invited uh, quite a few uh, scientists already, and this is the first seminar in 2020. Uh, we have uh, Professor Anders Heffield from uh, EPFL in, in Switzerland, and uh, Monica is going to introduce him later. I just wanted to say that uh, he was there uh, here at ICN2 in the Institute a couple of weeks ago, just before uh, the, the shutdown of, uh, of the centers and the activity in Spain. So uh, he was uh, smart enough and uh, clear uh, to, to go back to uh, Switzerland. And uh, we, we had to cancel the seminar that was uh, scheduled for Friday. Uh, but we are very glad that he accepted to give it uh, uh, remotely. So I just wanted to say a few words about uh, the Cardona uh, seminar series. You know that uh, Cardona was a very prominent uh, Spanish scientist that was uh, uh, working for a long time in Germany in the Max Planck Institute. He was actually the founder of the Max Planck Institute for Solid Statistics in Stuttgart. And he was really instrumental in the development of solid state uh, science in, in Spain. Uh, he actually um, was in the advisory committee that guided the, uh, uh, our neighbor institute, uh, the Material Science Institute in Barcelona, ICMAP. Uh, almost 30 years ago, and uh, he was also very much involved in the development of our institute, of ICN2. Uh, he was for a long time in the Scientific Advisory Board, and he was giving advice and, uh, uh, and uh, counsel to um, our Scientific Advisory Board President, uh, Michael Sanbenon, and also to the uh, Catalan government in this issue. Uh, he was really instrumental in, in our institute being uh, what it is now. So. Uh, I wanted to, to stress that uh, very much. Uh, for the people that didn't uh, know uh, Manuel, he was really a, an outstanding person, an outstanding scientist. He had a prodigious memory. He remembered everything about everybody. Uh, and he was really a, a, an excellent uh, person. Uh, he passed away a couple of years ago and he's really much, uh, very much uh, missed. So uh, this is all I wanted to say. Uh, so let me give the word to Monica and thank again, Professor Heffield for accepting uh, to give this talk uh, today. So thank you. So hi everybody, I am Monica Lira Cantu. Thank you for being here with us for our Manuel Cardona lectures. Uh, we are here at the Catalan Institute of Nanoscience and Nanotechnology broadcasting from Barcelona, Spain. Uh, before I, I start introducing our invited speaker, I would like to give you just one comment about the questions. You can, uh, in your, you can see in your screen a, li a little icon that says Q&A on the bottom of your screen. That is for you to write the questions that you might have during the webinar or maybe at the end of the webinar. I will try to read those questions to Professor Hatfeld at the end. If there are too many questions, probably we, uh, we will make a, a document at the end and post it online if we cannot answer online everything. So let me introduce Professor Anders Hatfeld, as I'm sure many of you know him. He's professor in physical chemistry at the EPFL in Switzerland. He obtained his PhD in Uppsala University in 1993, and he was postdoc of Professor Michael Gratzel back in 1993, 1994, also in EPFL. 
Uh, here results, as you of course know, is uh, based on uh, photovoltaic energy, especially dye-sensitized solar cells and also perovskite solar cells. He's also interested on solar fuels. Uh, he has published more than 530 scientific papers and when they have more than 65,000 citations. He has an age index of 123. Uh, he was ranked number 46 on a list of the top 100 material scientists of the past decade by Times Higher Education. Uh, between 2014 and 2019, he was on the list of Thomson Reuters highly cited, uh, cited researchers. He's a member of the European Academy of Science, the Royal Swedish Academy uh, of Science in Stockholm, the Royal Society of Science in Uppsala, and the Royal Swedish Academy of Engineering Science in Stockholm. He is Dr. Honoris Causa at the University of Paris in France. I'm very happy to have Anders Hafel here with us. Uh, Anders, thank you for being here with us. Please, welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Monica. Uh, it's a big pleasure for me to give this Manuel Cardona lecture. Uh, it's a pity that I cannot see uh, see you, but uh, thanks everyone for for joining. Uh, I'm sure there is uh, a lot of friends and colleagues, uh, so I'm very happy that you could could join. Of course, we have uh, more serious things going on than than perhaps uh, uh, solar cell research, but I think it's important also to uh, to to carry on our our lives. So I hope everything is well with all of you. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Pablo, uh, Monica, uh, for invitation to ICN2, where we spent uh, very nice days. And then, uh, unfortunately, I had to go back to Switzerland and now stay at home. Thanks also, Alex, for, for the um, technology. So um, with that, I see if I can share the screen uh, here. And uh, there we go. And uh, then I should see if I can make there. Let's see. There we go. So uh, my talk today is is uh, is a uh, very honor for me to do this Manuel Cardona lecture at ICN two, and uh, I will give a little bit of brief introduction to photovoltaics. That's just some small data just to, to get the picture of where we are in the industrialization of photovoltaics. And then I will uh, jump into our research at, at EPFL. Uh, as I say, you are, of course, mostly welcome to Lausanne and hopefully sooner than later, you have the chance also to visit our beautiful campus at the Lake Geneva. So to say a few words on uh, installations of solar cells, it is, as you know, uh, an exponential growth over many years. Uh, it is at the end of 2018, a total installation of uh, 500 gigawatt peak, which corresponds, depends how you calculate, but uh, roughly 70 to 80 nuclear power stations. Uh, and um, it's, it's been growing, it was 100 gigawatt 2018. And if you look where it's mainly installed uh, right now, China is the leading country and also in terms of production, uh, the leading country and it's followed uh, by India, and the United States. Uh, if we see how much electricity which is produced per year, it's uh, at the end of 2018, around 2.6%, so you see that we do have a lot of work to do to, uh, to fill up the gap to, to become, a, 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 let's say, a real huge player of electricity production. So much things needs to, ha to happen for the future. Uh, what has made this exponential growth is, of course, the, the uh, reduction in, in cost. Uh, and I found this from Fraunhofer as a report, which tells us that um, the cost reduction, or actually this is the price, so this is what, what people pay for, uh, has really gone down in the learning curve, uh, which is 24 years 
24% uh, per year over the last 38 years. So if we go up, up somewhere where I started my own research in uh, so young PhD students, it's here, 1990, and then the cost was, uh, or price was per module, about $10 or, uh, per peak watt. And we always said that, well, that's ten, at least 10 times too much. So there we have uh, research and development to do. And when I started to write my own research uh, applications, which is down here, 95 somewhere, um, the first sentence was al always that uh, PV photovoltaics are very interesting and renewable energy source we need to have. Uh, but at present, it's 10 times or more too expensive. So we need to do research on other technologies than the existing one, which is and was silicon. So uh, that I could do for, um, yeah, let's say about uh, 20 years. Uh, but then I, we cannot to say that anymore because the, the price of silicon solar cell has really gone down a lot. And, and I remember we set up as a dream target in the beginning to go down to one dollar per peak what this is euro but it's quite similar so coming to this line to be able to do one dollar per peak what in production um, would be something where we really find a breakthrough and we said also silicon can never do it but silicon can and it's in price now down to 0.3 euro which is looking back in time just completely amazing how, how much the cost reduction and it has been stimulated a lot by by china as a, as the leading production uh, country um, so uh, this is good news for uh, photovoltaics it is as cheap as any other source for electricity production uh, and it's then very challenging for us to find some alternatives or let's say finding photovoltaics as cheap as silicon but maybe can do it in different ways and that's a little bit now what I will talk about. Uh, another uh, performance data which is interesting to look at is how long time does it take to get the energy it takes to produce a silicon solar cell and then get it back so to speak in electricity production. Uh, and as you see here we have a map and if you get to the yellow red colors it's about one year. So if you are here in Barcelona, uh, if you buy solar cell, your energy payback time, as we call it, is around one year. And if your lifetime of the PV is, let's say, uh, modestly speaking, 20 years, you will produce a net um, electricity of more than 95% of the lifetime of your PV. So for sure, you, you get your energy, energy back. And even the country uh, where I come from as Uppsala here, um, it's not more than two years in energy payback time. So that takes me a little bit to what we are doing at EPFL. And today I will talk uh, and introduce from disensitized solar cells uh, leading over to perovskite. I intended to say a few words on hydrogen production. Uh, but I think time does not really permit there. We work a lot on oxides like cuprous oxide for hydrogen production. Uh, and if you're interested, uh, one of our highlights from the lab is uh, uh, this paper here from Nature Catalysis, where we achieved 3% overall uh, hydrogen production from sunlight uh, using only a pure photoelectrochemical cell. So starting from the disensitized cell, I always like to introduce it as, as something which is um, a very good technology to introduce to, um, to students. Um, at least here in Europe, we are always facing uh, the challenge how to attract young uh, students, high school students to study chemistry. Uh, and we developed this kit back in Uppsala for the International Year of Chemistry 2011. Uh, with the intention that you can make your own solar cell without knowing basically anything about solar cell or chemistry uh, and see that you can do it in your own kitchen, so to speak. Um, so we built uh, these boxes. I think we made 50 of them and um, they were lent out to Swedish high school uh, and became very popular. Now I haven't followed really the last years if we still do it, but uh, it became successful 
Uh, here are the ingredients how to make your own dye sensitized solar cell. Um, you need for a solar cell, just like a battery, to have a, two contacts, a minus and a plus. Uh, and then uh, you have an electrolyte to shuttle the charge between the contacts. Um, for a solar cell to work, we need, of course, the light to drive the electricity. So our contacts need to be transparent, or at least one of them needs to be transparent. And that's these pieces of glass here. So here we have cut glass in about two square centimeters. It's a normal soda glass. Uh, the top layer is our contact. It's a conducting a transparent oxide. So it forms a transparent, but still electrical contact. So this we uh, cut for the students to use. The other ingredient we have here is a bottle of uh, electrolytes. So that's an iodide salt, like sodium iodide, in an organic solvent. It can be ethanol or a acetonitrile solvent. We have here uh, powders of titanium dioxide. So that's small nanoparticles forming these powders. We have a pencil, scotch tape, some clamps. And for the high school students, uh, the task they have is to make their own solar cell to drive this calculator. So we take out the battery simply here. So it's, it's um, the solar cell which needs to, to drive it. Um, and if you know about dye sensitized solar cell or think about the name, there is of course one important ingredient missing and that's intentional. That's the dye itself because we tell them that, um, well, you go and find your own dye molecules and see what you can uh, innovate or, or create uh, in that sense. So here's the way of doing it. Um, you start by making a slurry of the TIO2 paste. You spread it out on your contact. We have the scotch tape here for two reasons. One is that it makes a certain thickness of the TIO2 layer and it also forms um, a contact and we can take away the scotch tape and attach our contact. Um, then it's a step here, which uh, is a heat step where we can use a, a burner if you have a classical chemistry lab or, or a, a strong heat gun, for example. You heat it up to 400 degrees for about half an hour. You bake it in a way, and then you have formed this TiO2 layer, which is uh, uh, then a sponge in nanoscale, let's say. It's a porous electrode. So when you, we dip it into the dye solution, um, you, the dye goes in and stick to the surface. Uh, and here is the fun part of the lab, really. We, the students have, uh, have seen all kinds of, of things uh, being tried. Uh, what we know works well is uh, blueberry. It's a kind of Swedish national um, type of dye sensitized solar cell. And, and the simplest thing you can do is to take this TiO2 and just put it, put it down in a, in a blueberry um, from the from your grocery store. I know in the UK, uh, people in Bath developed a solar cell based on tea, of course. Uh, Switzerland, I remember we tried different wine and um, it was a kind of wine testing, not taste, well, we did taste it, I have to admit, but uh, we found, I remember one bottle which was particularly good for making electricity as well. Um, I have seen a student in Stockholm coming and say that he tried his own blood and, and that seemed to work too. So he made a blood sensitized solar cell. Um, that's the negative, the minus electrode in our solar cell. Um, we need then the plus and that's simply made by, by putting some uh, pencil or graphite on, on the other contact. And you put the two and clamp them together and then you bring in the electrolyte which uh, shuttles the charge between the contacts uh, and you're ready to attach your crooked ions and, and measure, sh shine light on it and measure the current and potential electricity you get out. And for the high school students, they have also to realize that to drive the calculator, you need 1.5 volt, not a lot of current and you need, can get that by serious connect three, four cents like that. So that's how the lab uh, operates. And uh, this is uh, some, a picture from Uppsala uh, on the shopping street uh, back in 2011, where we see this 
kids uh, looking very curious when Julia is making, having them to make this kind of solar cells. So it's, it's, a, it's a nice uh, educational uh, kit for show, demonstrating chemistry. Now I go over a little bit more to, um, to the introduction of how it happened. Uh, I will not spend too, too much time here, although the history of the dye sensitized cell is, is fascinating in many aspects. Uh, the big breakthrough came in 1991 with a very famous nature paper from Brian here and, and Michael Gretzel, uh, where uh, the whole thing changed in terms of how to make efficient solar cells. So the, the, um, before this paper came out, the typical efficiency of dye sensitized solar cell was way below 1% uh, conversion of sunlight to electric uh, energy. Uh, and in this paper, it was an order of magnitude jump to about 7%. And the big secret was that one could use uh, these nanoparticles to form a high surface area, even porous system, which means that you can absorb a lot of dye molecules and then that way you can uh, harvest uh, sunlight in a very efficient way. The paradigm shift which happens here was that if you read textbook on how to make efficient solar cells like silicon, uh, what you should absolutely not do was to use a high surface area electrode. So this uh, changed completely the game of, of how to make efficient solar cell, entering also chemistry and simple uh, laboratory techniques how to make uh, solar cells. So it was truly a paradigm shift uh, creating a lot of, of excitement. We also had to work out how the solar cell work fundamentally and, and the first years here was, was very, very exciting, I must say, with a lot of controversial debates on how, how it worked and so on. But that's maybe for another webinar to go through a little bit on the fundamental side and the history of it. Um, the operation principles is the following. We have here our transparent conducting oxide, our contact, we have our TiO2 nanoparticles, typically 20 to 30 nanometer in diameter. It forms this porous sponge where we have then the dye molecule, the red spots on the surface. We have the electrolyte and typically it's iodide, triiodide as our redox couple. And then we have the plus, the cathode as we say uh, on this side. So light comes in from this side normally and then you excite the dye, so the dye uh, is then injecting electrons into the TiO2. It goes through all these particles and that was one of the huge mystery in the early days how this actually could happen that efficiently and we extract it as a, as a current and potential. We go to the plus and we reduce uh, the electrolyte and then the electron is brought back to the die and we can start uh, working again in the next cycle, so to speak. So the processes here, we call the electron from the dye to TiO2 injection and bringing the electron from the electrolyte to the oxidized dye, we call the regeneration. Uh, and here's a lot of materials chemistry you can imagine. You can have, uh, and it's been published, sure, I'm sure, more than 10,000 types of dyes. You have all kind of nanostructures uh, to think about, oxides, electrolytes, solvent, solid state, polymers, and so on instead. So it's been a tremendous a lot of amount of work on the material science on, on this uh, solar cell. Um, interestingly enough, the very almost the very first um, materials used stood its time very, very well. So this is the TiO2 material, as I said, it's a you can see it as a nano sponge. This is the top view and it's porous all the way down to the contact. Here is the dye molecule and, and this is a very classic one which was the state of the art, the best for more than 15 years, developed in Gretzen's lab uh, and N here is Professor Nasiruddin. His third dye and now he has, uh, I don't know how many N it is, but it's certainly a thousand and there are Sakharudin's thousands of dyes and and other dyes as well. But this was surely and still is, is very much a reference in our field. And as a reference for the electrolyte, it has been the iodide triiodide. And it's very interesting uh, philosophically, I think, to, to, to reflect a little bit how challenging it has been to, to change. This is almost the, the very initial work, early days of, of the materials. So the dye here, as I said, was the best for, let's say, 15 years 
iodide, iodide that was, was the best and still the most used one um, practically for 20 years. And the TaO2 is very much almost the same as we, when we started. So it's been very, very challenging to, 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 um, um, to develop this complex system. But we have made progress and I will come to that now. And the starting point for our research back in Uppsala then uh, with Sjöldhjett uh, Borslo, uh, we started to look into where, uh, how to improve. This iodide typically at best gives 10% efficiency. And we started to think how to move it up to maybe 15%. Uh, and the question was, where are the main losses? Um, and it's, it's um, no secret, and we knew it from the very beginning almost, that the big drop in potential we lose internally in the system is between the redox potential of iodide and the potential of the oxidized dye. Here we typically have a gap of 0 0.7, 0 0.6 uh, volt. And that is something we, we have to we lose in, uh, internally in our system. Uh, so that's where uh, Jeanette and I thought that, okay, here is where we need to attack it. And the problem with iodide, triiodide, is that it's not a simple redox system. It goes through intermediates, and we identify this iodide, iodine radical, as an intermediate species, which also has a redox potential. So when we bring back the electron to the oxidized dye, from the intermediate, we have uh, maybe 0 0.3, 0 0.4 volt. And that's the driving force to regenerate the dye. Then we lose 0 0.3 volt to make the I3 minus. The advantage with the I3 minus is that it doesn't accept electrons from the TiO2. So remember now that the electrons are moving in the TiO2, and we have a high surface area, so it is close to the surface and it may react with the electrolyte across the interface. Uh, and, uh, and that's a very probable situation. And that's a loss. That's a, a short circuit uh, current. The thing with the I3- is that that's not very probable. And that's why it was used so much. And when people tried all other kind of redox couples, that was the problem. And the way to fix it would be to passivate the surface here so you avoid electrons from TiO2 to react across the interface. So people try that and um, you think about making uh, maybe some insulating oxide like alumina oxide, zirconia oxide, uh, passivating molecules, so this cannot happen. But it, it, it really was not successful to introduce a new redox couple, the iodide, triiodide. But we thought back in Uppsala that if we have a, should have a chance to improve, we have to work on that and we, put the PhD student on that topic. Um, it's uh, Sandra Felt here, and she really had a challenging first years uh, where basically nothing worked. Uh, she started with Brian Gregg's silanization of the surface, didn't work very well. Um, we had other projects. I think this breakthrough we had 2010 is a good um, story of how science works when it works at, at best. Uh, so Sandra Felt had the task to find some new redox couple for disensitized cells. Uh, we had, uh, in uh, collaboration with Professor Li Cheng Sun in Stockholm, uh, work on organic dyes, and this was a triarylamine dye, and here you have the anchoring group, the TiO2. And Eric Gabrielsson, a PhD student at the time, he introduced these alkoxy groups with the idea to avoid aggregation of these dyes, which is a problem for organic dyes. So the initial idea was to introduce these alkoxy groups so they are spreading out and you don't form the aggregates. Um, what we found with this dye uh, was that this dye itself passivated the surface very well. So uh, we thought maybe with this dye we have a chance to work on something else than iodide. So Libby Gibson here, who worked uh, on nickel oxide as our oxide and cobalt complexes. And I, I don't know exactly here, but I, I always tell it like the coffee story that the three of them had a coffee and said, well, uh, I have these dyes, Eric said, and they work well. Libby said, Sandra, maybe you should try this cobalt. And uh, that became a very successful combination. So when we published this, it was really a breakthrough. We were up to 7% efficiency with these cobalt complexes. 
And the most important thing was fundamentally that we had a very high, a high voltage, 0.9 volt, which we compare with iodide, which is typically 0.7. So we gained 0.2 volts. So that meant that we had really uh, closed the gap of uh, losing potential between regenerating the dye from the redox couple. So this showed us that it, indeed, if you pass away the surface, we can do other uh, complexes. So this became uh, quickly an uh, uh, interesting topic. And I remember I presented it in Korea 2010. And uh, Michael Gretzel called me a few weeks later and said, Anders, uh, uh, we also now work on cobalt. We have 10% efficiency. And a few weeks later, he called and said 12%, and it moved up. Uh, and uh, I think the published record for cobalt species is 14% efficiency from, from um, the uh, Japanese company. Um, of course, uh, we will still work fundamentally. So our question now was if we had 0.7 volts loss uh, with iodide, uh, and what, what do we need in terms of potential driving force to regenerate the dye efficiently? So we could, together with Michael Gretzel and Nasiruddin and the team, uh, synthesize several cobalt complexes with different redox potentials. So here you can see that we can vary the redox potential closer and closer to the potential of the dye. That means that in terms of photovoltage, we can hope that the voltage goes up because voltage is the difference of this level and this level. So if we go down here, we increase the voltage. On the other hand, we also lose driving force. It gets smaller and smaller potential drop here. And at some point, uh, we have the optimum where we, we can't go much lower here. And for cobalt complexes, that turned out to be 0.4 volts about. And what that was the measurement we did, which is called the Marcus theory plot. And uh, I just show you this because the peak of my uh, career was on this picture here, where I, um, we are in Rudy Marcus' uh, home in his uh, garden. It's a hot, sunny day in July uh, in Pasadena. And, uh, we discussed uh, dye sensitized solar cell and so on. And for me, of course, this was uh, a kind of a, a dream to, to be able to have coffee and um, blueberry cakes and, and ice cream with Rudy Marcus and discuss our, our measurements. And it followed really a very nice Marcus plot, as you see here, when we changed the driving force. So it, it's uh, even, so we could imagine that it goes into the inverted region. Anyway. Um, that takes me over to what we are doing right now, and that is to move even further on that scale here. So uh, we started in 2015 together with the Merck company to look into copper complexes where we have even lower driving force. And we could show that uh, as low as 0 0.1, 0 0.2 volt difference here is enough to efficiently regenerate the oxidized dye. So copper complexes has really become uh, our focus point in the last years. And it has two very interesting uh, properties, as I will come to. Just where we are in terms of efficiency, this is a paper where we have a co-sensitized scheme, which we think is important with these two different organic dyes, uh, where we publish 13.1%, uh, but with a very high potential, more than one volt, as you see here. And that's the virtue of using copper complexes, that we can give, get very high voltages. Our best lab result at the moment is 13.5%. Uh, uh, so, so it's uh, something we are trying to, to also certify. Uh, the introduction here, and that was Marina Freitag, a postdoc in Uppsala at the time, uh, found something we call the zombie cell. And that was a very uh, another surprise you have sometimes when you're lucky. Uh, and that was that when we fill up the dye sensitized with electrolyte, it's typically in a liquid. Uh, and um, then if the sealing is not very good, it dries out. So the liquid evaporate and you're left with the dried out cell and they typically don't work. There's no transport between the contacts. Uh, so um, ac accidentally, uh, some of the people in the Uppsala lab uh, was going to throw away the dried out cells after a month they dried out and for some reason he thought that okay let me uh, measure them to try out the equipment I think and then he saw that it actually works very well so a dried out cell here like a solid state dye sensitized cell works as well as in the liquid cell and 
uh, Marina and uh, the colleagues coined uh, the term zombie cells because they should, in principle it's dead, but it, it comes alive and that was the cover art uh, here when the zombies are coming to regenerate the oxidized dye here. So the solid state dye sensitized cell we think is very interesting. It has 11% efficiency and fundamentally very interesting to see that the conductivity of the electrolyte here in the liquid state actually goes up in the solid state in the zombie cell. So there is a change of mechanism for transport uh, in the electrolyte, which deserves much more attention, I think, and, and really a, a, an area of, of research which uh, needs uh, more fundamental work and, and also more uh, development to make this in a, in a larger scale uh, application. Uh, the second virtue, uh, besides the solid state, is that these cells work very nicely in ambient light. So if you need a power source for indoor light, and if you have a sensor or internet of things and so on, uh, the dye sensitized solar cell is, is really, as far as we can say, uh, the best type of, of uh, photovoltaic we, we have seen. So uh, Marina, here I advertise her paper, uh, came out just very recently where she has, with her colleagues, uh, seen an efficiency of 34% of measured under indoor uh, fluorescent lamps. So this is not a solar efficiency, it's an indoor lamp efficiency, but still the potential is very high. And what uh, they did more in this paper was to drive an uh, artificial intelligence network to show that this is ideally suited for, uh, for uh, powering uh, Internet of Things devices. So I think there we will uh, hopefully see uh, a lot also of, of uh, applications. And one company which are which is trying this very very intensively is Exeger, located in Stockholm. With um, at least I think it's growing uh, all the time. But what I've heard some months back, there were more than 100 people in the company developing dye sensitized cells for ambient light applications. With that, uh, I come into the next um, topic. Uh, and um, over the years, the dye sensitized cell had, have, as I said, um, very interesting materials properties. So you can vary basically everything. You can vary the dye to look into quantum dot. So you have quantum dot solar cells, lead sulfide, inorganic semiconductors. Um, you can have pigments like uh, perof with perovskite crystal structures. You can vary the electrolyte, so you can go to solid state. And one, I think the first solid state dye sensitized cell was done by Udo and Udo Bach and, and Gretzel's lab uh, was this spiromeotad, which is an organic amorphous hull conductor. Uh, so this was going on in different directions uh, and so on. And if you now take a pigment like an uh, inorganic, organic uh, perovskite structure, uh, um, semiconductor as your dye in a way, combine it with spirometad, you have the birth of perovskite solar cells. And the first one who made that uh, solar cell is a very good friend of mine since many years, Tom Miyazaka here, uh, also a very skilled and enthusiastic violin player, also publishing papers with his violin, so if you're interested in his other publications than just the perovskite, uh, you will find some of his uh, violins uh, from uh, Italian manufacturer, actually. Anyway, the first paper of um, perovskite solar cell was this paper 2009, uh, where the, he used the uh, methyl ammonium lead triiodide as a perovskite structure in an iodide-based electrolyte. And, and uh, um, I think we saw it as a kind of modification of disensitized cells. Tom also said, well, it's a bit of curiosity because it doesn't work very well, 3-4% uh, efficiency, and it stays uh, alive for maximum 10 minutes. So he said, I'm running to do the measurement to the solar simulator, and, uh, and I'm happy if I get some efficiency out of it. So it didn't pay very much attention uh, to start with. Namgyu Park, Professor Park in Korea, took it up, published 2011 uh, paper with higher efficiency, six, seven percent. But the real uh, breakthrough and the surprise came with uh, two papers, 2012. 
done in parallel and in, independent of each other. Henry Snaith worked a lot in Oxford with spirometad as a solid state high sensitized cell. He contacted Tom to say, can I try my spiro on your perovskite? Michael Lee was the one who developed it. Um, Namjoo Park, uh, with his and Kim and the team, uh, did the same thing actually with spiro uh, and went to Michael Gretzen to do some fundamental work as well. And the two papers here came out with exactly perovskite and spiro with 9-10% efficiency uh, in 2012 in two different papers. Um, one key point in uh, Henry's paper is this figure here, where they, uh, because in the dye sensitized cell, we need to inject the electron from the dye into TiO2. Um, and if you then take something which uh, you cannot inject to, like alumina oxide, it's an insulator, it shouldn't work. But to, to the surprise of, of Henry and his team, it worked as well, and even better in, the, in that publication, to use uh, perovskite on, on an insulating material. So uh, that, that has to work on perovskite itself, that can transport electrons through the layer. And uh, Edgar Lios uh, with Michael Gretzel in the same year also showed that the holes can be transported through the perovskite layer as efficiently. And then uh, with these papers, we saw the amazing explosion of perovskite research. Uh, as we know of today. So the perovskite uh, is a struct crystal structure. Um, it comes from a, a Russian mineralogist called Perovsky, uh, but he didn't, was not the one who found it. It was uh, uh, Gustav Rose who was finding it and named it after Perovsky. It has a cubic structure. Uh, you have the lead in our case in the corner. You have an octaeder of halides, iodide, like this, and in the center of the cube, you have what we call the A site or the cation, methyl ammonium, classically. Uh, that's the perovskite structure, and uh, the methyl ammonium lead iodide has a good band gap for solar cell, 1.55. Uh, when you excite electron hole pairs, they easily dissociate, uh, so it doesn't take. Uh, much in exciton binding energy, they dissociate, and the lifetime of them is long enough that the charge can diffuse to the contacts, electrons to the negative and host to the positive. So it's an ideal semiconductor in that sense, and moreover, it can be produced in your chemistry lab. So you can do it in solution processing, uh, which, is, which is a real amazing um, uh, observation. So uh, here is the um, uh, the uh, development, as you see here comes Perovsky 2012, we have uh, initial work and it went quickly up uh, with different introduction of, of preparation procedures and you see here a very steep slope and today it's 25.2% efficiency of the perovskite, which is higher than the other thin films like CIGS, cadmium telluride and what is left here is monocrystal in silicon which has uh, a very high 26.7 and I think it's a chance that perovskite goes here uh, not too far away if the coronavirus also uh, goes away so we can go back to the lab um, I think there is a real chance. The next in line is gallium arsenide which is at around 29% efficiency so perovskite really in the short term has has made it to the top of the world in terms of uh, world record efficiency in photovoltaics and it's made in a normal chemistry lab, let's say solution processing, whereas silicon has to be made in, in, in uh, expensive and, and uh, vacuum machines and so on. So, so that's um, the excitement. Uh, I come now to a little bit on EPFL research. Uh, this is a starting point to work on uh, mixtures of the composition. So as you see here, uh, you can mix in other halides than iodide, you can take bromide, it stabilizes uh, the composition, makes higher quality morphology, it shifts the band gap uh, in a way we don't want for a single cell, so it increases the band gap, which, which is um, something we don't want really, if we don't want to use it in a tandem cell. Uh, also the cation can, can be changed, metal ammonium was the first one to use, but then uh, people here uh, in Gretzen's lab, 2014 is this published, 
started to use the form of medinium. We call this the double cation recipe with the double halide. Uh, and that was uh, for some time um, taking perovskite about 20% in efficiency. And here is uh, our world record we took uh, in uh, around Christmas 2015. Uh, with uh, Dong Xin Bi, uh, postdoc at the time, she's now a professor in China, uh, who uh, took it to 21%. So we were very happy at EPFN to have the world record for well about three, four months, uh, because in March next year, uh, uh, Professor Sang Il Suk took the record back, and then uh, it has been ever since then going up. Going up. Uh, so as I said today, 25.2%. Um, this composition and engineering became a, quite of a drive uh, for us and uh, Michael Saliba uh, here postdoc at the time now will be leading a PV activity in Germany as a professor. Uh, Taisuk was also working on this. Um, uh, developed what we call the triple cation recipe which has been kind of, kind of a reference uh, composition in the community from then. Uh, the interesting thing with adding cesium to the formamidinium methyl ammonium is that it, it uh, improves the quality of the grains uh, so we can get over 20% efficiency. Uh, but moreover, it also, if you compare here, this is the triple cation with hundreds of cells measured. Um, and if you take then the average or the spread, it's it's more narrow spread than the double cation. So we we uh, put our neck out here and said that also the triple cation, besides increasing the efficiency, also improve reproducibility. Uh, when the reviewer came back to us to say, well, if you say that, let's prove it. And the question was if there was some more than one person in our lab who can do this and and we these cells are actually made by three four people as a team effort to show that that um, not not only there, there's not only one champion in the in the lab so to speak so um to continue uh, the composition and engineering one has to look into the size of the ions uh, and you can calculate something called the con tolerance factor and um, when you do that, it's a geometrical uh, formula, basically, with the radius of the ions. You can see here that if you take methyl ammonium, it falls in the window of where you can form the perovskite structure. We should be between 0.8 and 9, 1 here to form the perovskite structure, uh, the cubic alpha phase, as we call it. If you go to form amidinium, it's a little bit on the larger side. Cesium, a little bit on the smaller, but the combination of them makes, makes a very good quality, as I said. If you go further, rubidium is a little bit small here and so on, but there are certainly others you can try. So um, one thing uh, we did then together with Michael uh, Saliba was to try rubidium to add as a quadruple four cations. And that became uh, also a very interesting stability data. You see here also the SAM pictures that you have very nice almost columnar monolithic grains of the perovskite with not many grain boundaries, which is important in the horizontal direction. If you have grain boundaries like this, uh, your charge, which goes up and down like this, had to cross them, so you don't want them. And with this more monolithic growth of the perovskite, you avoid such grain boundaries. We think that's one of the key aspects of this composition and engineering. So the result uh, we got with this quadruple one uh, was 21.6%. Uh, More important perhaps was that the photo voltage was very high. It's 1.24 compared to the band gap 1.63, which means that the theoretical maximum thermodynamically we can get is 1.33 volts. So you see we only lose 90 millivolts between the potential here. And that's re really very high. That that's puts perovskites in the same level as silicon and approaching gallium arsenide. Uh, now, a good solar cell should also be a good light emitting device. So you can check this uh, voltage by doing uh, emission test. So you, you reverse the solar cell to emit light instead as an LED. And that is done here. You see the red spot, that's a light emission uh, device. And the electroluminescence was also record levels here at the time around 
four, three, four percent efficiency, which also uh, is a very high quality factor. So with that, we think um, even if we are doing it in, in, in very crude solution processing, we can get very high quality uh, photovoltaic devices. Also, the stability was, was a, a very um, interesting result at, in this uh, paper. And here we changed the spiral to a conducting polymer, PTAA, instead, where that was important for stability at high temperature. And here you can see that we measure operating conditions of the photovoltaic perovskite cell for 500 hours. It's 85 degrees uh, continuous illumination and operating maximum power point. We are not sealing the cell, it's a nitrogen atmosphere to avoid encapsulation as a, as a parameter for the stability. Um, so, so that's um, a very promising stability data. You see also something interesting here, that is at the end when we switch off the stability measurement, let it rest for a while, we also jump back a little bit in efficiency, which is a very intriguing effect of, of uh, perovskite. So here I would also like to uh, advertise Monica's and, and um, well, there's I think something like 60 people on this paper, uh, but it's a very important paper, I think, for how to do stability testing of perovskite solar cells. So it's a, it's a statement and it's, it's uh, to take into account the peculiar properties of perovskite. Uh, Monica was driving this very much together with uh, Eugene Katzi uh, and Mark here and, and, and uh, with, with the whole community. So it's, it's, it was a very nice effort of, of them to bring this together. One of the peculiar effects which, which deserves uh, also fundamental research is, as I said, if you start to do your solar cell efficiency measurement here, you decrease maybe 5-10% of your power output. You let the solar cell rest and goes uh, to switch it off. Maybe it's overnight. And then in the morning, you are back again in the same efficiency. So there is a reversible uh, decrease here, which jumps back when you switch it off. So that put, uh, takes the question how to do stability testing. If you just follow the power output continuous light, you may feel that, okay, it's degrading here. But if you do chopped light, six hours difference, it looks very stable. So that's one of the things which needs to be understood and also to be taken into account for stability testing. Uh, besides compositional engineering at EPFL, we have also uh, been driving um, uh, different types of device structures. And this is what we call the planner device. It's the simplest possible device for perovskite. It's basically a negative contact with, uh, we typically use tin oxide here as a compact layer. We have then spiro and gold on top and then perovskite in between. So here we separate the charge in the perovskite layer and they go then to the selective contacts. So this can be made under 200 degrees Celsius. So it opens up for flexible substrates and so on. Um, and uh, here was a, a kind of a breakthrough paper on planar devices from Juan Pablo and Ludmila uh, measuring 18% efficiency. So we have continued with that and one of our more recent uh, work um, with Silver here and, and, and uh, Michael Saliba. Uh, and this is a, a direction which is now happening and that is to try to go as close as possible to pure FA led I3. There are two different reasons for it. One is that we don't want the bromide to increase the band gap for the efficiency point of view. We don't want to have MA which is more volatile than FA because of stability reasons. So we really would like to come to, uh, to this composition as the ideal band gap and, and uh, uh, the ideal efficiency. Uh, and this work, uh, we came fairly close. We got 20% efficiency. Uh, what we did here was to compositionally engineer and we work on, with cesium and rubidium on the FA site here. And what is interesting for us is, uh, if I take this a bit quickly, uh, here are cross-section SEM pictures. If you take FA uh, only without cesium and without rubidium, it looks, here you have voids of bad morphology, let's say. We start to add cesium, 1%, 5%, 10%. Morphology is much better and the solar cell also works quite well, 17, 18%. 
uh, with 10-15% cesium. If we take the rubidium instead, it's always poor morphology. Big voids, very poor solar cell efficiency. Interestingly, it is the combination of 5% rubidium with 10% cesium and the rest FA, which gave us the best uh, results and best morphology. So this is also an intriguing thing with the composition engineering, how to tune your composition to find the best uh, results. Another direction is to passivate the surface, and this is a very recent work from uh, Yuhang Liu and Hongwei and others um, uh, in the LPI team and, and, and with us. Uh, and I just wanted to measure that, mention it because um, normally people have used this uh, phenyl ethyl ammonium iodide as a passivating molecule. The idea is that you take that to the perovskite surface between perovskite and spiro. And then you can passivate recombination centers uh, to reduce uh, losses. Maybe you can even extract the holes faster to the spiral. Uh, what was developed here was this uh, tert-butyl uh, structure, which works as a kind of an umbrella in the passivation molecule layer. So uh, uh, we obtained two things with that. One is to passivate recombination centers and extracting holes quicker. And the other one is also that this is a hydrophobic molecule. So uh, if we look into a contact angle measurements, this is without any passivation. This is with the uh, phenyl ethyl. And this, as you see, you increase the contact angle in a hydrophobic surface, which also makes it more resistant towards humidity. And we got uh, our best stability device with this uh, TBBA uh, passivation molecule after 500 hours, 95% left. This is not the high temperature measurement. Uh, uh, and also the efficiency is higher than with this passivation molecule. I'm starting to come to the end. Uh, in terms of fabrication, there's a lot of development how to produce in large scale. This is uh, our sort of, we are not making large scale modules and so on, but we are working on a, we think, interesting, uh, um, technique to fire the perovskite uh, in seconds. So typically we anneal the perovskite film 100 degrees for half an hour or so, or maybe less. Uh, but here you can simply take your perovskite film, you illuminate with infrared light source, and you form your perovskite film in a matter of seconds or even less. Uh, and uh, Sandy Sanchez, as a postdoc, have shown that he can get more than 20% efficiency. And by varying the uh, flash uh, uh, time, how long time you expose to infrared light, how long time between the flashes and so on, he can control the morphology uh, and he can center also UV, uh, TiO2 films with UV light in the same chamber. So this is something which we think is suited for road to road fabrication and it's something we are developing further. So I'm coming to the very end, and that is uh, our most recent results. And uh, we are continuing our direction to go to as pure FAPI, as we say, form of medium lead triiodide composition as possible. Uh, this is work by Hai Chu Lu. Uh, and as you see, the cross section looks very nice, nice grains of the perovskite. Uh, our data, unpublished so far, we have an open circuit voltage champion of 1.19, which uh, should be taken with the theoretical maximum 1.25. So here we now only lose 65 millivolts. We think that's a kind of new record in terms of, of um, lowest potential loss, which also corresponds to a very high electroluminescence, uh, maximum 8.6%, and it, the solar cell current, we have around 6% electroluminescence. It's uh, this measurement here, where you see the light here. Now, um, let me just finish a little bit by dreaming. Uh, our efficiency here at best is 23.5%. Uh, the record we have is the voltage. We are losing a little bit in the current, but let's take current values which are published, combine it with, well, I would say this is a stretch, but people have seen such high field factors, together with the voltage we measure here, we are getting uh, higher than 26%. So I think um, that can be possible. I put it as a dream, 
but I wouldn't be surprised that we see something like that uh, from someone uh, in the near future. I just want to finish also that our surprise is coming up with perovskite. This is a work by uh, Monica um, uh, and Haibing and others from ICN2, uh, which may lead to new applications. Uh, what is used, tried here is to change the contact to a ferroelectric oxide, uh, which you can pull so you, uh, you open up the current uh, in a ferroelectric manner, and then otherwise it's the same perovskite structure. So here is a starting point, low 1%, you pool with applied potential and UV light and you increase your efficiency up about 10% and then it remains fairly stable for hours in, in that ferroelectric state. So open up and switching off uh, potential or current uh, with simple pooling like that may lead to, to other applications. And I say that as a thank you to Monica over the years and this is a nice picture from Monica's office. Um, and with that, I say thank you very much for your attention. Uh, so thank you very much, Anders, for a very, very interesting talk. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I hear okay. you. I stopped Excellent. sharing, I think. There. Okay. Yes, okay. Thank you for a very interesting uh, talk. Uh, it's amazing how the... Um, Dye sensitized solar cells and solid state dye sensitized solar cells have evolved in the last 15 years and also oh, everything that we are you are obtaining with perovskite solar cells. This one point almost to do bolts in these uh, solar cells is really impressive. Um, so we have several uh, questions. I'm going to try to read it in order. Uh, I'm going to choose some of them. Let's start with the question that says, could you please comment on the possibility and requirements of implementation of disensitized and perovskite solar cells for indoor photovoltaic applications such as uh, Internet of Things? Yeah. Uh, so I see now I didn't have any time. I see I talked much longer than I was uh, thinking to do. Uh, anyway, thanks for your patience. Uh, and thank you for the question. Uh, Many, I think there are many different views, so I give you my, my opinion on, on that. I, I think for dye-sensitized cell, uh, to me, it's ideally suited for indoor application. Uh, first of all, it has a very good performance in the indoor light. Uh, it's not so sensitive to diffuse light. You keep a high potential, which is needed to drive the, let's say, Internet of Things devices. Um, and uh, it's, it's, you can use simple dyes, copper complex. Uh, you can even design it so you have a nice aesthetics. It can be shaped in flexible substrate. Uh, you can have different colors. Uh, you can make your color perfectly uh, overlapping the spectrum of the light source. So you can optimize efficiency if you want. But you can also use it as, as a surface of, of a device where you don't really see it as a solar cell anymore. So you just have your product and the surface is your solar cell, which you don't think about really. Uh, on the perovskite, I'm sure they also work very well in the indoor light. My, my problem there is the lead content. Um, I think the lead content is something we, we probably can uh, have in terms of uh, large scale electric electricity production. Uh, with PV exemptions, legally and so on, but to have have them in consumer electronics, uh, I think uh, I, I, my personal feeling is that that you you people will not legally also not uh, not accept any lead in consumer electronics. Somehow I lost your voice, Monica. I don't know what happened. Oh, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, well, you are already asked uh, answer some of the some questions that people is uh, asking. Uh, well, somebody asked especially about the how abundant and eco-friendly are the materials in world record-breaking cells, perovskite solar cells. I guess they. Talk about. Um, 
Yes, I, um, on terms of abundancy, uh, one can of course, now I mentioned cesium rubidium, which maybe has a, uh, I'm not even sure if, if it, there will be maybe some small amount of cesium on, and maybe rubidium too in, in them. Uh, overall, the material um, use, the thickness of the perovskite layer is typically uh, half a micron thick. Uh, so in terms of abundance, I, I don't see a problem, even if you have some some uh, uh, some elements which are not very abundant in, in, in the earth, let's say. Uh, but it will be very, very minute uh, use of them. So, so in abundance, I, I don't see a problem. Okay, another question is, uh, in the latest unpublished results, uh, tin oxide is used as... I guess they talk about their unpublished results. Is used as the electron transport layer. When using tin oxide in our group, however, it seems that passivation layer on the ETL, in the electron transport layer, is needed to reduce hysteresis or to have higher stability during slow GV measurements. Did you ever experience such problems in your group? Yes, yes, we do. Uh, I, I think it's important to say to people working on it that, that if you see problems, with this theories and so on that uh, that uh, everyone has it and of course we publish the, re the, the results which work well <laughs> but uh, there's a lot of work behind it so so uh, the tin oxide yes has uh, has uh, you need to work closely with the preparation of the tin oxide layer we normally use a compact layer on FTO you may have pinholes there so sometimes we have even made two two layers uh, and it's a trade-off between thickness and because thickness gives resistance and and if it's too thin you may have pinholes instead so there's a clearly an optimization in the tin oxide and, and treatment and so on so so um, there's no surprise that you may have hysteresis problems uh, we also in the starting point we used ALD deposition of tin oxide so you form an amorphous structure of tin oxide which we think is important for the efficiency um there's something th th these are in the detail so it's something we can discuss maybe more if if, if the person who asks have more questions we can take that over email or something but uh, for sure um it, it needs uh, quite a lot of work to optimize it okay thank you uh, can you comment about if there is any shift in the lattice parameters of uh, rubidium incorporation? Uh, not as far, not much as I know. Uh, the rubidium is, we think, not in, actually incorporated in the crystal lattice. That's been discussed quite a lot, but solid state NMR and other techniques uh, shows that the rubidium is doing something else than replacing the cation. And we think it may um uh, react so it, it forms a passivation uh layer in grain boundaries or it interfaces generally speaking uh maybe also react or attract iodide so you form uh, some rubidium iodide uh, interface layers between grain boundaries so still the effect of rubidium is is not completely clear as far as I can tell, uh, but it's not incorporated. That That is quite clear for us. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, any change for carrier multiplication effects in perovskites to go beyond the SQ limit? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, uh, not as far as I know um, that, that people are trying that of course uh, to see if you can get uh, either uh, multi-exiton generation or um, or have uh, uh, well to use uh, trap states to have uh, low uh, energy photons to pump up the electron to the conduction band um, this can be very especially interesting with two d two dimensional structures i think where you can see um phonon electron interaction in, in different ways uh, as far as i know i haven't seen that that it's uh, that someone has said that it's uh, it's it's um, that you you pass by the shock liquid limit but theoretically you can of course and i i, I think the perovskite structures 2d structures as well uh, 
deserves uh, a lot of fundamental work on in this direction as well. Yeah, very nice question. Um, I think we have a question from India. Uh, thank you, Professor, for the excellent talk. My question is, could you please suggest some alternative beside cations for lead in, in perovskite solar cells? Instead of lead? Um, well, I, I think there is, uh, there's been a lot of work on tin uh, to replace it. Uh, it's very challenging because tin, uh, tin is, is not giving the same kind of, of electron, um, uh, electron uh, states, electronic states and so on. Um, so it's, it's uh, let's say that you have defect states are not as protected in tin as they are in the in the lead. Also tin is, is, is highly unstable. Um, so tin is not an easy thing to work with, but there is progress. Uh, and I think pure uh, tin perovskite is, is um, increasing uh, slowly, but, but um, maybe about 10%. Uh, what is very intriguing is the tin lead mixtures where, where things have really progressed. Uh, I know one paper from Kai Chu and Enril team where they can make a low band gap tin lead mixture which also uh, is stabilized with, with a good tandem efficiency. It's a science paper uh, published last year. Um, so there is things happening there. Uh, then you have what we call the double perovskite which is also um, which, which are not really the same uh, just to replace it. It forms a, so what you take there is typically uh, you, if, if you have the lead uh, with the valence state, you take uh, two other uh, elements with, with, let's say, vismut and silver, for example, is a classical one, uh, and try to form what we call double perovskites. And there is uh, work there which I think is is also well well to do and important, uh, but still very very modest efficiencies to do that. What is the efficiency under the, of the bismuth the silver? Double perovskite. Oh, now I'm guessing someone maybe or oh, the participants know better than me. I think it's still uh, just a few percent. Okay. One, two percent. Okay. Another question is, I'm curious about the description of the pure FAPI devices against the ones with cesium and rubidium. Can you talk a little bit more about that comparison? Yeah, well, it was a big work uh, on the compositional engineering. As I said, the, the, the whole goal with, with this exercise was to try to see if uh, we can find something which works by compositional engineering, but also avoiding MA and uh, bromide. So that was excluded, no MI and no bromide. And then it started to see uh, what can we do and, and uh, then our choices was to use, or to use cesium as, and rubidium, as I said. It could be also potassium is a candidate, perhaps. Uh, so, so I know we have tried a, a, a what do you say, a quint, quint, <laughs> a quint tip, uh, a five cation things with potassium, but uh, which, which, so, so there are many options. I mean, if you just take a matrix of, of of number of uh, permutations and things you can do, you, you start to, and I know Michael Saliba always to give that uh, table as a diagram of, of options you may have. Um, so what we came up with was, was as an optimum composition, but it, it was basically uh, hard work to, to just go through the, the different uh, ratios of, of rubidium, cesium and FA. And, and uh, as I said, we, we, we need to understand more of the mechanism, I think, of the crystal growth to, to take this further in a more scientific way than, than more. Of course, it's, it's, it's a very good thing for um, high throughput uh, machine learning things, I think, to, to use. So you have two directions. Either you try to fundamentally understand what you're doing, or you say, we, we don't understand what we're doing, but let's do as ma many many samples as possible, let's say. And so, so I think both things are, are um, ongoing and, and good to take. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's see. I think uh, we still have a lot of questions to come, so I'm going to make the last one. Yeah. And probably we can answer the other ones by uh, email or, or posting the document online. Yeah. Um, 
Uh, this is an uh, interesting one. Considering the present state of research, what would be your way to deal with the problem of stability apart from what today exists? I think they are want to know your secrets. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, the stability. So the, this this is um, we have, we are an academic group. Let's say we are. Let's say uh, we, we do encapsulate ourselves, but we are not saying that we are mastering the ceiling. And I, th I think uh, companies which works with LED and OLEDs and so on, they, they have their, their secrets, let's say. So in terms of ceiling encapsulation, we have no secrets. What we are routinely doing is to avoid that problem with ceiling. And that is to have a holder where we have nitrogen around the device. So we're flushing nitrogen gas continuously around our cells. Uh, and then we measure a temperature, UV, uh, visible light, maximum power point, and so on. Uh, and then uh, as a function of, of the materials we are, we are developing, let's say. So, so that's uh, one approach to do it. Um, the stability research is tricky because it takes time to know the answers, let's say, and, and uh, um, we know, for example, that's, I would say, spiroometad is, is, is uh, for us at least, not stable at high temperatures. Um, the pro well, the problem for us was actually that the gold was not stable with the spiro. So we had gold um, atoms diffusing through at high temperature, not in, in room temperature through the spiral and into the perovskite all the way through to the TiO2 actually. And then our stability data I showed you was uh, then coming by, by uh, 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 replacing spiral to a conducting polymer. Or you replace uh, gold with carbon, for example, that looks much more stable, or ITO. Um, so gold spiral is, is the bad contact. Otherwise, we, we see fairly reasonable stability. Uh, the next thing is, of course, to take to to say, well, are they stable for 20 years or 30 years, like silicon? And there we have a lot of things to do, of course, uh, in both in terms of testing, how to do it, uh, how to analyze failures, so we understand degradation mechanism, how to speed up uh, so we get quicker results and so on. And I think there is a huge area of research, again, maybe with machine learning and so on, to get data and understand how to make them stable. Um, in the beginning of the perovskite, I was, I have to admit, very skeptical. I thought they will never be stable. Um, and I've been pleasantly surprised how, how uh, much has developed in terms of, of stability. So it's, it's promising, uh, I would say, but, but for sure, um, much more needs to be done here. Thank you very much, Professor Anders Hadfeld. We have Many other questions, but I, as I say, we have to stop somewhere. Uh, we promised the, the, our uh, audience that we will make a document and put it online in this, I, I guess, in the same web page where we announced the, the webinar. We will, I will send the, the questions with the names to Professor Andrew Hatfield and we will put it, post it online. We will make uh, advertisement advertisement of that. So in from my side, I want to say thank you very much for a very, very interesting talk. Uh, we are very happy to have you here. I hope we can, uh, I mean, you know, it's the first uh, webinar and I think it was a success because uh, we have about 270 people attending. Um, I hope this will be the first one of several and, and, we, and I, I really hope we can have you uh, with us again to give a, another lecture. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you everybody thank for you. being here. Yeah, thank I you. think, uh, thank you. It was my first webinar too. Uh, I, uh, I, well, it, it's been, fun. the only thing, uh, the only problem, or not the only, but the big problem is of course that we are missing out on the dinner tonight together. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> next time. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Do it for next time. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. And thanks okay. for everyone for listening. Thank, Thank you, you very much, everybody. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.